Welcome to Music Matters 2020. 
Thank you for joining us on our unique podcast community where we explore the issues and the, and the themes of 2020 uh, through the music community, through the eyes of distinguished colleagues. 2020 is a challenging year for us all, and um, it's great to interact with great artists and to pick their brains and to see how, what, what they're doing during this uh, challenging times. And today we have a wonderful guest. We have Kevin Short, an international bass baritone opera singer who's had a distinguished career in both the United States and abroad. And we're delighted he can join us today. Remember to subscribe on YouTube and hit that bell for the most up-to-date information and upcoming guests and topics. Like our videos and share them. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, remember to use the chat feature to uh, join in the conversation. We always love to have people on the call to chat in and to, uh, to add your voice to the conversation. Welcome, Kevin Short. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me. We're so glad you can join us today. Um, Kevin, tell us about your career and how you started singing and about um, about uh, what drew, drew you into a life in the arts. Well, a life in the arts. I had these parallel tracks in my life. Um, I grew up an athlete and a musician. I wrestled and played football in high school and was involved in instrumental music, jazz band playing the bass, uh, the clarinet in the orchestra. I went to college on a wrestling scholarship and wrestled there um, and was unable in college initially to be involved in music and I started missing it. So I one day was walking through the halls of the music department the choir director saw me and said, may I help you? I said, well, in high school, I sang in the choir. And he told me to come in and sing a few patriotic songs. I did. And he said, well, I can offer you a full music scholarship. <laughs> so I switched my major from phys ed to music ed. And I was not at all familiar with opera, but I had some wonderful mentors, starting with my voice teacher, Betty Malchus Ridgway, absolutely fantastic teacher. Um, the choir director also served as a valuable mentor and a music history professor, Dr. Dominique René de Lerma, who was a graduate of Curtis. So they sort of got me on track. I sang a lot of competitions and won most of them and then i went to curtis and once i got to curtis my under i should say that my undergraduate degree was at morgan state university in baltimore and then i received my masters at curtis once i was there at curtis then i was fully engaged in this career and from curtis i went to juilliard to what was then called the american opera center and i won the met competition and being there in New York, you know, you're there at the hub, the center of everything. I picked up my agent there, um, Alec Troyhoff there, Columbia artists, um, started singing with the New York City Opera Education Department, and then graduated to the City Opera, the tours, the national tours where I sang Figaro and Notte di Figaro. And, um, and then made my debut just a couple of years after having attended Juilliard. And that's where it sort of all began. That's sort of my Reader's Digest trajectory. That's wonderful. We, we condensed some incredible uh, things into a very short amount of time. Tell us what it was like to step on the, uh, to make your debut at the Metropolitan Opera. I see that your first season was a, was a blur of excitement. You had a lot of roles very quickly. Tell us about that. I remember that very first day rehearsing on stage. It was Fanchula, La Fanchula del West, the girl of the Golden West. And I had never been on a stage that size. And the set itself, looking at that Western town, the depth of that stage, it seemed like a real mountain back there. It was absolutely incredible. And I think my mouth, I was slack-jawed, mouth open for the first hour, probably. By the way, I felt the same way 
um, the first time I sang Bohem there at the Met. And the first act was okay, but that second act, I'm sure you all have seen it. And um, I remember being on stage and looking around and unbeknownst to me, the carriage carrying Musetta was coming from stage left. And fortunately, Mark Oswald was able to pull me out of the way before the horse and carriage came. So in my those direction. incredible Zeffirelli productions, not the Zeffirelli production, that's the, uh, the magnificent, uh, most ornate production. Yeah, it's a shame to see those productions go. We were down to a lot. I think, there's one, I think the Turandot set's the last Zeffirelli production remaining at the Met these days. That's right. I sang the Mandarin in that production. Same feeling to be involved and in, enveloped by that set. Yeah, I think after the tour, that will be it. I don't know if there's money around, if there will be money around to spend for those kinds of productions. But I think, and Bohem, Bohem is still around. But I think that um, productions like that have a real value for people. New York is a, is a tourist center. So even if you don't love opera and you, you go to Bohem or Turando, you are able to be enthralled and engaged. I always hear gasps when the second act is revealed or that scene, the big scene when Turando makes her entrance. And it never ceases to amaze me to see the audience's reactions. So you returned, uh, you, you've done many roles to the Metropolitan Opera and hundreds in your, your career, I see. Um, what was it like to take the principal role in uh, the title role in Porgy and Bess this last season? You know, I was waiting a long time to have that final, final bass speak. I wanted, the thing about singing that role <clears throat> is Porgy shows off all of my strengths. You know, it starts off in the basement, so you are a real bass. And I have a pretty long voice with an easy top. And you end with the high G's and things and the trio, which is very Wagnerian. And I just wanted to, have to sing a role that allowed me dramatically and vocally to show off and explore, not show off in the, in the superficial sense, but to display all of what I can bring to the table. And Porgy does that. Such a challenging role, especially with the uh, having to play the person with a disability and uh, you have to, how do you manage that uh, to, to, um, to use the posture to, to get and keep your technique in line? Well, fortunately I've now sung a good many productions of Porgy. So I have integrated my turn, I turn my foot in and I've done enough productions where I am using now a crutch. So I figured out how to balance it. I turn just enough and contort my body just enough to maintain my support and my breathing. Um, it's actually easier to do it with the crutch than it is to be on your knees the whole evening on a cart. Have you done it that way as well? many times. So I happen to also be fortunate enough to have been fortunate enough and hopefully this production will continue. But there's a production that travels throughout Europe and it's very, very traditional and they use a cart. The f that I find really hard. That's the famous Borkheimer production, right? That's been going for years, yeah. right? <laughs> That's sure. right. Yep. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the evening, I am, oof, my body, my knees, I soak in Epsom salts, and and with that tour, I've done that. I don't know, hundreds of hundreds of performances throughout Europe and even Asia, um, and even three performances back to back to back. But it's it takes a long time to get your body into shape for that kind of production, and then you feel it afterwards. Is that the most physical role you've performed, or have you done ones that are more physical than that? I think that's the most physical, yes. 
Mm -hmm. Wow. I cannot think of another. I mean, I did a production of Faust once where I had to jump and, and, but nothing that required, that made the demands where I felt like at the end of the evening, where I felt my body was, was wrecked like that. Barkheimer production. You got that incredible fight. You have to kill Crown in the show, and that's uh, an incredible fight sequence that worked in there too. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's a demanding one, certainly. Right. So, tell me about um, after you you've uh, conquered, you've come to New York. Your career has grown. Now you moved to Europe for a good stretch, right? Right. So, what I found, so I as I said, I made my debut just a couple of years after having been involved in the American Opera Center. And I sang in the course of eight or nine seasons there. I had a plan artist contract. And that's as close to having what the Europeans call a fest contract when you are engaged by the theater and you can sing upwards of four or five performances a week. So I had that kind of a contract, a weekly contract, not a guest, weekly. And I would sing, I would go to the theater one night, I would sing enough, one performance, the next night another, the next night a different opera. So after about six or seven years, I noticed that I topped out at the quality and the size of the roles Colina in La Boheme, which is fantastic. Uh, Mazzetto and Don Giovanni. And I found myself stuck in the middle between the box office bases, like Sam Raimi, Jim Morris, Paul Plischka, those guys, and the young artists. And I thought, okay, I'm very young. I would like to sing some of these larger roles. I'm not going to displace any of those superstars. So maybe my path is to go to Europe. And there are a couple of reasons for that. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason that was just as paramount for me is the way we do opera in the States very traditionally. And, and I know and knew then that opera in Europe Regie Theater, as they say in Germany, is um, very much updated. So, um, and as a black singer, black opera singer, black bass, that it would be easier for the Europeans to see me in roles that traditionally American theaters would not maybe be inclined to cast me in, such as the Dutchman. Um, and I thought, okay, now's the time to go. I really wanted to go sooner than I, than I did. So I went over there for a guest engagement in St. Gallen, Switzerland, to sing Ozmin in the abduction from the Seraglio and another Colina in Bohem. While there in St. Gallen, um, I heard about an, an audition in Basel, Basel, Switzerland, and for Zarastro in the Magic Flute. I sang the audition. They gave me the job and then asked if I would mind coming to Europe and had taken this fest, open fest contract, which I didn't know at the time. And I said, yes. And that was my avenue. And that was, I've been over there now for 20, well, I should say I'm back and forth now, but that was 20 years ago. And I'm still a Swiss um, permanent resident and could have years ago, just haven't gotten around to that, but it's been... So what are some of the roles so, so, that you got to uh, experience when you were in Switzerland? What are some of the roles that were dream roles when you first started your work there? Well, Dutchman, not just in Basel, but throughout Europe. Dutchman, um, Fortas and Parsifal, um, Lannegraf and Tannhäuser. Uh, um, some of the roles were repeats. I was able to sing Philip and Don, Don Carlo. Uh, um, 
the Borita Mephistophele, the Gullo Mephistopheles and Faust. Uh, um, that's about it, I would say. <laughs> that That's the entire canon of dramatic bass roles, so that's a good start. <laughs> Yeah. So getting to do all those roles, and there's so many performances in, in Europe to get to, to. So once you made your career there, that you got to do those roles so many times, how did that change your singing? I'm glad you mentioned that. It's so interesting. I had, you know, the way we do opera here, you know, you have maybe a few weekends, especially uh, once you leave the huge companies, the Met, you can rack up a lot of performances. But my very first year in Basel, for instance, I sang 35 performances in the Magic Flute. Um, Dutchman, 22. Um, Faust, 15 or something like this. Anyway, I found myself, especially in flute, performance 13, 14, 15, it turned into my own personal laboratory. I decided, okay, tonight I'm going to try it this way. I'm going to sing it that way. And I found myself becoming really comfortable with singing with an orchestra. In fact, I was more attuned and accustomed to singing with an orchestra than I was to a piano because every night I was singing with an orchestra. Once the performances, once we had gotten through the rehearsal stage and the performances were all up and running, especially midwinter until the end of the season. Um, and it was just fantastic. So I believe that practice makes permanent. And so my technique was really honed. I really figured out that was one area where my singing really progressed. Um, huge deal. And there's no substitute for that. And I'll give you an example. So I did a Dutchman in Indianapolis. And I have a good friend, Chris Ermiter. And Chris sang the Dalant. And Chris had also sung a few productions of Dutchman. And I think maybe for productions, he sang less performances than I had on one production of Dutchman wow. in Switzerland. Oh. It's amazing um, how that that repetition and the uh, the constant um, engaging in the art form it 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 it, it gives you that uh, that seasoning and that uh, that you grow as an artist. Um, did you start teaching in Europe? I know your teaching is an important part of your portfolio, along with your singing. Were you teaching at that time as well? I was not. What happened with the whole teaching thing? I would give master classes and realize that I really liked it. And I have a good kind of aesthetic awareness and a good ear for what people are doing. Now, what happened with my whole teaching career was in 2012, I was singing a wonderful production of Faust in Indianapolis. And a good friend of mine, Esther Jane Hardenberg, reached out to me and said, well, I consider joining the faculty at the University of Miami. And I wasn't certain, and I had a full calendar the following year. And I said, well, if I were to come on board, um, you would have to work with my schedule. I would like to then bring in people to cover for me when I had to be away. But Grand Wilson, who sang the Faust, said, Kevin, if you harbor any notions about teaching you have to build a teaching resume the same as you do a singing resume and I would strongly consider it and Gran has been not just a great friend but a wonderful mentor and advisor and I took his advice so I accepted I accepted the job there and taught there for five years and um, now I'm teaching at the University of Maryland which is my home university. I was born in D.C. and grew up in, in Maryland. And it's the flagship school here. So I was, it's sort of my dream job in a sense. Well, especially it's, it's so great that you can bring your experience on the stage while you're still active in the art form and you're still very busy and engaged all over the world. And you could bring that to your students. Um, 
it's such a wealth of knowledge uh, for any level of students. So do you teach different levels of students? Yes, all the way from the freshman through the doctoral students. And you're right, I think it's beneficial to have teachers and people at the university that are active. I'm able to call, make phone calls on behalf of my students. There's a student now in Amsterdam that's working and I was able to set him up with my agent there in, in Dusseldorf. Um, and again, I still maintain um, a residence there in Switzerland. So if someone needs to stay there while they're doing an audition tour, um, they're welcome to do so. That's fantastic to be able to mentor the next generation of singers coming up. Um, what excitement do you get when you watch a student grow? It's incredible. I have to say that it actually surpasses my own excitement and, and the satisfaction I get when I perform. When I perform, there's a certain amount of catharsis. But I sort of, you know, whew, I got through that. I didn't mess up. But with my own students to see the growth and to see them discovering. And I consider myself, I say this, not to be cheesy, but a dream facilitator. You know, what is it that you want? I have a lot of the answers to help you realize and actualize your dreams. So to see students be turned on by this art form and to realize their goals and aspirations, it's nothing like it. Are you involved in the opera productions at the college? Are you, do you help and coach or do you help? How does that work for you at the college? Well, the opera, the Maryland Opera Studio is a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, and they have wonderful coaches. Um, the voice faculty, you know, you have Grand Wilson, Dolores Ziegler, wonderful, wonderful former Met, Mezzo, recorded a lot with all the greats. Um, Carmen Balthrop, Jennifer Casey Cabot. We all have extensive experience. But we are called upon primarily as um, voice teachers and for special situations because they bring in the best. So um, I don't have to wear too many different hats. I teach diction, um, German diction. This past year I taught Italian diction. But as far as coaching, we are not called upon to coach. Um, we could, but we find in our lessons that we're dealing with some of these things. Um, let's see, the movement component, that's covered wonderfully with the Maryland Opera Studio. There's very little that we sort of have to step in. It's so specialized and so, and wonderfully compartmentalized that though I could, I could even teach makeup. I took that at, at Curtis and have done my makeup in a lot of different places, but it's covered. Yeah. That's fantastic. How have you seen the, 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 the training of young singers shift in your lifetime from when you came up to what you're seeing today? There's not that much of a difference. We, there's always been a huge acting component, but I will say that at the Maryland Opera Center, the acting component, component is even greater than it was when I trained in the late 80s. Um, but I think Americans and the American method of training has always tried to mesh and meld the musical and singing component with the theatrical co component. But it's even greater today than it was when I was in school. When I went to Curtis and Juilliard, um, it was emphasized, but not nearly to the degree that it is now. Maybe to other institutions, but when I compare Maryland, Maryland Opera Center to my training at Curtis and Juilliard, um, there's a difference. It's good to hear that we're, we're fostering that next generation of talent and getting them ready to take the stage and um... And we wish them all luck. So let's shift into the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic era. 
Um, how did that affect you directly, and um, how are you dealing with the uh, the repercussions of this today? How does that feel in in your personal experience? Well, I was when I was involved in the, the uh, La Traviata, singing Dottore, in the Met production. So we had a few more performances left. So I lost three performances there. Was able to do a live recording of Poor Game Best with the Philly Orchestra, where I sang my first crown. Um, so we got that in in early April in Philly. But then I, I was scheduled to return to the Philly Orchestra to sing in the, the Electra. So that was canceled. And another disappointment was the fact that I was slated to sing Castor in Cincinnati Opera's world premiere production of Castor and Patience. And that's been postponed till next season during a period when I have to be engaged to sing in the recording of Ballo and Monte Carlo. So now I'm, I'm not going to be involved in that world premiere at all. So, yeah. So they haven't rescheduled that. that you can imagine the composer also must be just devastated. You spent all that time writing an opera, which is the most challenging of all things to write, I would imagine, and then to watch it fall through like that. Hopefully they'll, they're planning to bring that back soon. They'll bring it back without me. But the other thing is um, he composed that role with me in mind. Oh. And I'm sure now there's plenty of time Whomever they have on board now, they can make whatever adjustments they need to make vocally. And they were very good about it. And maybe maybe if the opera is picked up by another company, I can somehow be involved. It's a wonderful opera, and folks should see it. What was it like singing Crown when you're also doing Porgy at a similar time? It was very interesting. I felt myself, it won't be the full uh, reading of Porgy, just excerpts, but I still found myself wanting to jump in when I heard Porgy's music. What do you root for when but, you're both the bad guy and the good guy? It's a tough one. <laughs> that, that's right, yeah. Um, vocally, I found it very interesting. It also sits a little high, so... It was fun to just get out there and sing these declamatory statements. And I also sang, so it was really condensed. So I sang Jake's music oh. in the beginning. Yeah. So I was wearing a few hats. Well, that's the one thing about Porgy. I tell a lot of my a lot of my friends who are younger baritones coming into the field, who they can do a lot of roles in that show. It's such a great role for a baritone. I, I imagine that on the Barkheimer tour, there must be people who can sing every one of those roles because it's just such a great yeah. opera and it's huge cast. I remember I performed Porgy in uh, in Newark at the New Jersey State Opera, and casting it was such a challenge because there's so many featured roles and leading roles. Really, a challenge. Right. It really is. Big chorus, you too. Graduate, big chorus. That's really important. It's a, a great chorus can steal the whole opera. Yeah. It's the voice of the people coming together to uh, weather the adversity of the storm, both inside and out. It's a powerful story, a powerful metaphor. Right. That's right. Yeah. And for a young bass, you can graduate from the smallest role if you happen to be a bass baritone and will one day sing Porgy. My first introduction was through the chorus and then some of the smaller roles. And then I sang Jake and finally Porgy, you know. How do you, now um, so, some singers are reticent about taking roles in Porgy and Bess. I've, I've heard through career, through some of my colleagues. Um, I, I just think it's, I think it's American Verismo opera. I just think it's a great show. I love, I just love the whole, uh, the whole, the fiery passion of it. It's just a great show. But have you ever felt any of that in your travels? I didn't. I, I understand this. You know, in the, in the 80s and early 90s, I would hear this a lot, that 
accomplished black singers would sort of avoid Porgy. Um, they didn't want to have this label of being a Porgy singer. But I think that people, like I can take you for instance, Maestro, you would be able to hear a young singer and know that they aren't just a Porgy singer. You would be able to hear the possibilities inherent in that voice. And I think maybe some of the roles you aren't able to, to hear, they would translate to Mozart and to other roles. So I think that was the concern. They would of being labeled just a Porgy singer. So they would always want to, to establish themselves in other roles, other operas before wanting to present Porgy. And you're balancing your and Porgy that, with your Wagner and your Verdi and uh, a million other roles in concerts, so it just fit part of your portfolio. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I didn't come to, to, to the role of Porgy until very late, though I've sung hundreds and hundreds of performances now, but I couldn't be labeled a Porgy singer because of the hundreds of other roles I've sung. Not roles, but performances of other roles. Yeah. So it would be hard, and I think that's the concern. Though it wasn't the concern I had, and I sometimes don't want to buy into those kinds of things. You know, there's nothing wrong. Sometimes people think, well, the subject matter. Well, let's look at Carmen. You know, it's, I think if Porgy were in a different language, not set there in Charleston, South Carolina with black folks, people would have a completely different, I mean, there's still in some quarters discussion about whether it's Broadway or a folk opera. And Gershwin called it a folk opera. That's what's written in the score. Yeah, it has a lot of attendant stuff. But it's certainly very heavily scored for a folk opera. There's a lot of thick orchestration. That's one of the um, things I find with Porgy and Bess is it, to write operas, it takes a lot of, um, to get really the, the formula right to writing a successful opera. Look at Verdi, for example. It took so many, it took him a long time to really get his sea legs writing operas till he wrote his first masterpiece, right? So um, with Porgy, I, I wonder if Gershwin had more attempts and more operas, he died so young, what would he have done with the orchestration? How would that have evolved over time because Porgy is such a great statement that I, I just wish he would have written more. I wish we could have seen where that went. I have the same wish, and it's incredible. And I would say that his first opera is better than a lot of our favorite composers' first operas. I mean, it's incredible. And that it's just so it's so interesting to see. You know, whenever. Um, Operas born out of the folk music of of a tradition. So Gershwin, you know, being in New York City and surrounding himself, hearing jazz, hearing it's also a, someone pointed out to me that there's also like elements of uh, even like Russian folk music kind of snuck in there too because that's what he was with. So he mixed it all together to make this kind of hybrid form, and it's just such a unique combination. I remember I did the premiere of Porgy and Bess in Albania at the National Opera House, and with with an orchestra that had never done this piece before and I was there for a month so I had a lot of rehearsal with the orchestra but we'd never have that here in America and um, I had to teach them how to swing or how to feel jazz which was such an interesting cultural experience for me right and how interesting I found that when I sing in Russia I remember having a concert there and singing um, orchestrated spirituals and how easily they were able to feel the pathos of the music. Um, but everywhere you go, they all love playing Porgy. And I've sung with, with Italian orchestras, German orchestras, uh, with the um, Philharmonic here in, in Sweden and Stockholm. And um, some, of, some of them come to it quicker than others, but they all love it. The Italians do really well with it. The Russians, yeah. You're right. Well, it's our folk. It, it's, it combines everyone. I think one of the most American art forms is jazz, and people love it. It's just universal. And then they hear that combination of jazz and great singing. Anyone who thinks Porgy is a musical has never tried to sing over the orchestration that he wrote. <laughs> That's right. I will say this. I've sung King Philip. I've sung um, Dutchman and Porgy. And Simon Essie said the same thing. At the end of the evening, I am more taxed 
after having sung Porgy than those other two that I mentioned. <laughs> That's great to hear it from someone from your, your level. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, it's, it's not to be trifled with. There are some roles, maybe sporting life, that you can toss off. You know, it can be a lot of character. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about a role like Sporting Life. You can, you can have these wonderful operatic tenor, tenors sing it, or you can have someone that plays around with it a bit more, and it works. But Corgi, no. You need to have a real first-class singer that can, that can handle the tessitura, the notes that Gershwin wrote, and just having the stamina. Though it's often cut, but if you sing the buzzard song and the trio and you go through the whole gifts there at the end, wow. That's a, it's a long, long evening. It's a long evening. How it runs almost four hours or three to three forty five or something like that. That's right. That's yeah. right. So back to COVID-19, how is that adjusted? We've heard all the canceled performances. With all of that time that you spend traveling with a career that you have, what have you done with that extra time that you now you suddenly find yourself with? I'm finding that I'm teaching a lot via this format. And a lot of people that have mentioned studying and working with me are now able to, they have time so I find myself being quite busy teaching and um, being called into a lot of Zoom calls and meetings um, with the university, with people wanting me to chime in about what's going on during this period. So I'm finding that I'm really quite busy. I could do with a holiday, a vacation, but the university starts next it's a week. Mine starts tomorrow. Oh, that's <laughs> my first wow. lecture is tomorrow. Uh, this I think we've started a week earlier this year, a week earlier than normal. So we're going to jump back in and uh, ride the tiger and explore what 2020 means in this specific year, which is going to be very different this year. But the um, most important thing is that we keep our communities together and that the students get that um, they know that we care and we're getting to jump in there and start their um, start their education and work work hard. Ah, yes. Great. Great. Well, I wish you well this semester. Do you also finish earlier? Because this is early, quite it's early. really early. Um, yeah, we usually start after a week later. Um, yeah, I, th I think we do because we're not going to come back. Well, we're not going to return to campus if we return to campus. We're not going to return to campus until uh, after Thanksgiving. So they're going to say that the, 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 I think they 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 view that as the highest flu season and possibly, you know, they're just being careful. Uh, right. So it just changes everything a little bit. And we're seeing some spiking at university. We're seeing spiking COVID cases at multiple universities, especially in the Midwest from what I've heard. But um, we'll have to all be careful and see where we are. And uh, I know Seton Hall is going high flex, which means that um, you know some will be in the classroom, some will be remote simultaneously. So we're trying to get back there and be safe. And they've invested enormous resources into making it safer as, as safe as possible. But... It's just still so much unknown with this virus. That's just um, very uh, challenging times for us all. That's the thing. So much. And it changes. Just think of the information that has changed and shifted since last April, March and April. Yeah. It's one of the the scary things and the hard things for us all is every time I think I know, I, I watch something, I, the changes within the weeks and we're trying to figure out again. Um, what do you think um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic will do to opera moving forward? Do you think there will be changes in the industry? I think initially companies will have to be far more conservative. I think the risk of having a production that doesn't sell well um, is, is maybe a risk that some of these companies can't afford to take. Um, I think it would call upon folks to be really creative, maybe so, a lot. If some companies fold, I think there'll be some smaller companies that will be um, able to uh, find some footing and find some traction. But I think it's going to be, to tell you the truth, it's going to be devastating because um, we are not supported in the same way that the European, that the German-speaking companies are supported. 
by the city and by the country. Yeah, we've so. we've had a couple of singers on the program. One from Austria, and you know they're they're covered. They're covered. Their contracts are covered. It's the singers in the states that are not, and that's um, scary times for our, a lot of our colleagues. And um, I wish everyone well. It's just, um, um, but I'm seeing some very interesting innovations from a lot of colleagues. Uh, online performances, streaming performances, performances from their kitchens, podcasts. It's kind of been fun. It's been interesting to see that people's talents, who I did not know that they had these talents, and. Uh, see you know from creative artists to see the creativity that comes out that's been very interesting to me and that's why i think i think that this period will reward those kinds of folks folks that think outside of the box that will explore the possibilities and that's what adversity should do actually it should you know it's it, it should be the seeds of potential prosperity in other ways in other avenues and that's what will happen Things will morph and, and people will find a way, maybe not in initially, but once we get our footing, the business, things should return. Well, that's that's our that's everyone's goal. Is the, this 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 time will be the crucible that uh, that, that crystallizes the next uh, the next uh, generation of performances. What advice do you have for young singers just coming into the career in this time? I would say explore the possibilities. Do not be wedded to the way things were, because the whole paradigm, everything has been broken. And I've always been a firm believer in going to Europe. Um, I think that they have things figured out in a way that we do not. So that should be part of the plan and just explore the possibilities. In some ways, a lot of people are going to make choices going forward where they will choose another profession and, and sing and sort of nibble around the edges of singing. But I think one can be rewarded through perseverance and endurance and exploring the possibilities. And I think the bold will prosper. So don't give up. Sage wisdom. Sage wisdom from a singer who's been in the career for a long time and has been doing inc incredibly good work for so long. And... Uh, it's been an honor getting to work with you and to watch you on the stage and to um, just be a present. You, you have such a great presence on the stage, and uh, it's always a, a privilege to make music with you. Thank you. Yeah, I've enjoyed working with you and look forward to any future collaboration. Right, we're going to get through this uh, together as an artistic community, and hopefully on the other side, uh, good artistic outboard just comes, comes pouring out. Because I think in this time when we're separated, we need music more than ever. And that's, it's, I think, the music and the entertainment industry is hurt the worst by this pandemic. Yes, yeah. The arts all, always seem to suffer, you know? And I think it's during this time that it's needed the most. You know, it's, it's going to offer a respite and solace during this very trying time. But there are going to be a lot of people, people we've relied on, companies, that may not be in a position to assist and help, but it's needed. What we offer is noble and is needed. It's necessary. Well, Kevin Short, thank you so much for joining us. How can people find out more about your work? Um, I'm in the process of revamping. I have my Swiss friend there, my website. You know. I don't know if people are familiar with Opera Base, B-A-S-E.com, but you can pretty much submit anyone's name, put anyone's name in and, and find out what they're doing. But um, my website will be up and running, though, as, we, as I said, my scheduled performances aren't until next year, and we'll see, but um, my website and Opera Base Base. And I'm with um, Athol Still. That's my agency there in London. Well, thank you so much. We wish you the best this year. And um, I know you'll be back on the stage with, in soon times. But thank you so much for joining us on Music Matters 2020. And until we meet again. Thank you, Jason. Take care. Be safe. Thank you for joining us on Music Matters 2020.
Uh, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider subscribing to us below on YouTube and hit that bell for the most up-to-date information and upcoming guests and topics. And we look forward to seeing you on other, uh, other broadcasts. And remember, keep music alive. Good night. Oh. Um.